Okay, we are now live. Welcome everybody. Let's see, I see the first few participants starting to trickle in. Hello, uh, if you're joining us now, you comment in the chat, please tell us what uh, country or city you're coming from. I always like to hear where uh, you know, people are joining us from today. Uh, my name is Dustin Betts. I am the content editor at the Founder Institute. And here with us today is Jared Yarnall Shane. He's the entrepreneurship director at the Biomimicry Institute. Really quickly, uh, if you're not familiar with the Founder Institute, we're the world's largest pre seed startup accelerator. We've helped launch over 4,000 companies across over 200 cities and six continents. If you're interested in learning more, about the Founder Institute. We're, we're currently enrolling uh, for cities across all six continents. And you can see the list of enrolling cities at fi.co slash enrolling. Uh, intro today, we're gonna be talking about biomimicry, bit of a different topic for us, but really exciting. Biomimicry, we're gonna explore it in, in detail, but it's really an approach to innovation that's looking to nature as a uh, potential uh, for innovation and solutions to human problems. Um, and sort of applying design thinking by mimicking principles and processes in nature. So uh, our speaker today, as I mentioned, Jared Yarnall Shane, he is the entrepreneurship director at the Biomimicry Institute, where he focuses on commercializing biomimicry based innovations. Uh, and before joining Biomimicry, Jared ran programs with the Penn State University's incubator and accelerator programs and was also the program director at Thought for Food, which is an ag tech and food tech uh, competition and accelerator launch program for young entrepreneurs. Um, Jared's works directly with hundreds of social impact startups from across the world and he's helped secure a combined 25 plus million dollars in funding for those companies along the way. Uh, Jared, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Awesome. Thank you, Dustin. It's been, it's great to be here and Dustin and I have started a company together several years ago. So um, yeah, excited to be back here chatting with you. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, we, we won't have to talk about that, but uh, we, we can at the end if you want. Um, at any rate, uh, yes, Jared and I are, are also go, go way back. Um, so the agenda for today is we're going to have, Jared's going to present a slide deck. We're going to have like a kind of introduction to biomimicry and how it's used practically in product design, where we're going to explore different case studies um, of products uh, that have been developed by companies through using biomimicry. And then we're gonna have plenty of time for audience Q&A. So please remember this uh, is for you. If you're watching this live, we're doing this for you. So please don't be shy, put your questions um, into the chat. And we have somebody from our team who's monitoring the chat and feeding the questions over to us. So um, we will get to your biomimicry questions. Don't be shy with those, um, all questions welcome. So um, without further ado, Jared, you wanna kind of yeah. uh, kick it off for us here with uh, your presentation and I'll, I'll mute myself for, for a while while you run through your deck. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Dustin. Thanks for having us here. Let me start up my deck. All right, good to go. All righty. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Before we dive into the meat of the presentation, uh, we just wanted to ask you all, what do you think this is a picture of? Um, I'll give you a few seconds. Type, type in your guess in the chat. Let's see, what do you think this is a picture of? It's welding, that's a good guess. Let's see any any other guesses here? It's something living. I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. Hey, there we go. Someone got it. It's a peacock feather. So here you can see the peacock. Um, we're zooming out. So that's a close up of a peacock feather, and I show that because it shows this such intricacy that exists in our natural world, and it shows some brilliant, vibrant colors. Um, Something though that I think is really unique is that those feathers are actually pigmented brown. So what we're seeing is wavelengths of light being reflected back in the green and blue and kind of that gold spectrum. So it's, there's no blue or green pigments involved. And I share that because of this quote. So uh, there's a group called Cradle to Cradle um, which is one of the, it, it's a licensing company, or not, not a licensing company, um, a certification company that certifies products life cycle and, and lifespan. And one of the issues with color, at least color how we normally do it, and humans do it, I should say, 
is we use pigments. So we use chlorine, bromide, um, these toxic you know, elements and chemicals that are bad for humans. So there's this quote that there, we can't make a green green, which is kind of ironic, at least not when we use pigments. But what if we didn't use pigments? What if we made color just like the peacock makes color? Um, or other animals make color. So you see here, this is the Cypress Morpho butterfly. And that brilliant blue color is caused by a similar phenomena that, that you saw on that peacock. It's called structural color. So it's how these nanoscales, these, these microscopic structures reflect back wavelengths of light. Without those microscopic structures, this butterfly would just look brown and, and be really ugly. Well, why is this important? Well. If we know in the natural world that really there's not many safe blue or green pigments, yet it's a color that we love, can we as humans recreate color in that same way? Can we make structural color? And my answer is yes. There's a company based out of Berkeley called Cypress Materials that has found a way to make this color. They, they mimic nature to make structural color. So what you're seeing here is they spray paint on and it's clear. And over the course of just a few seconds, a few minutes, it self assembles and it starts to reflect back wavelengths of light. And this is made with two materials. So they have two materials that they mix together into a paint binder. And based on the ratio of materials, they can tune the color to work across the visible light spectrum. And it can also work in the UV and the infrared light spectrum. Um, now, this is really cutting edge science technology. Um, it was actually developed in the Berkeley lab that uh, won the Nobel Prize for their chemistry work. So this is really, this is really advanced stuff. But imagine the possibilities. We, we could have cars that now don't have the heavy metal pigments that, that make them have that brilliant color, but uh, it's just the sunlight reflecting off that, that causes that. Um, because it works in the infrared spectrum, they can paint a coat that looks clear to humans onto windows or onto roof tiles, roof shingles, and it will reflect back infrared heat, which can reduce heating and cooling loads on buildings by up to 20%. So huge cost savings. Um, and the best part is there's these two materials that make up their paint and they can do this at a cost that's cheaper than paint that we have now. So I'm sharing all this as it's a, it's a complex, but I think it's a beautiful example of what biomimicry is. And, and like Dustin mentioned in the beginning, it's a practice that learns from and mimics the strategies found in nature to solve human design challenges. I like to break it down into the Greek language, which is where it was derived from, where we have bios meaning life and mimesis meaning to imitate or to mimic. So what we're going to show, I have a couple more examples to show some biomimicry solutions in action, but I also want to share some tools with you as we go throughout the presentation that you might be able to apply to bring into your own startup, um, or you might be able to apply to bring into your own startup ecosystem uh, to help your, your companies really get a, a, a head start uh, on their competition. And Biomimicry is important not only because of its ability to kind of rapidly advance innovation, but, but for several other reasons as well. So I already talked about the emulate. I already talked about the structural color phenomena that we see on species. But what we are looking for at the Biomimicry Institute is also this deep ethos. So what I mean by that is in the natural world, we have circular systems. You, plants receive energy from the sun, they use living material uh, and, and inert material, organic material on the earth to grow, and then that's decomposed and it's recycled and used over and over again. That doesn't exist in our man-made built environment. Um, in the natural world, coral can grow without the need for heat treatment. Um, they actually sequester carbon as they grow their, their structures that are similar to concrete instead of uh, producing so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So what, we're, what we believe is if we can learn from nature to, to mimic nature, we are on the path to sustainability. We can radically redesign our world. It might not look that much different, but it's going to be better for our planet and better for us as a species. 
And the other aspect of biomimicry that I think is just so critically important is this ability to reconnect. So you can see we're having a startup presentation about nature. You're learning hopefully some biology facts. I'm not a biologist or a naturalist, but I'm an engineer and a startup uh, guy. I've, I've had my own companies. But there's this beautiful aspect of how do we reconnect to our natural world as we go through this innovation process. So I wanna share another example of a company um, that I think really shows how we can encapsulate all three of those things. And I'm gonna start by showcasing um, this coastal construction. So um, most of you have probably seen marinas or other coastal areas where they have these kind of concrete pylons and they, they kind of look like jacks. Um, the issue, you know, we're building these to protect humans. We're building these to protect our ports, our ships, um, our coastline. And as climate change happens, as sea levels rise, as extreme weather events rise, we're gonna need more of this protection. Um, but an issue is that this is also killing the local ecosystems that they're coming in and, and kind of replacing. Um, and it's killing it for multiple reasons. Um, some of which are that the concrete itself is kind of a poison. Um, plants, animals, bacteria, they can't really grow on the concrete. The concrete's also, you can see here, extremely smooth. And in nature, there's really not smooth rock surfaces. Like, you know, you might find that in, in riverbeds, but along coastline, you're gonna have nooks and crannies and crevices and holes. And you also, if you think about coastline, the at least natural coastline, you're gonna have things like tide pools and other kind of features, macro design features that, that plants and animals can live in. So this company, Econcrete, they're based out of Tel Aviv, Israel. They're, it was founded by two marine biologists who, who saw this. They saw how human built construction came in and decimated ecosystems. And then they started to ask questions, well, why does this kill those species? What can we learn from the natural world to make this a design that is not only beneficial for humans, but also beneficial for, for the local environment. And you can see they have that macro scale structure here on the left. They also um, have, they design in flaws in the concrete product. So there's holes and nooks and crannies that things can attach to. And then finally, they also have a proprietary admix, a concrete admix that is life friendly. So it actually attracts life instead of kills life. And the result is here on the left or on the other side of the screen, you can see their product that's been in place for less than a year. You can see it covered in marine growth. And the best part is actually because it attracts this marine growth, these structures get stronger over time. It kind of bioprotects itself. So think about like seashells and other things that they're, they're these hard kind of calcium carbonate substances. As they grow, it actually strengthens the structure, which again, makes this cost competitive. While their initial product is a little bit more upfront, the lifespan of the product and the fact that they meet environmental regulations um, makes them competitive in the market. And I just wanted to mention that both Econcrete and Cypress Materials, they both have products on the market. These, these aren't things that are kind of in a research lab. These are both real companies that exist today. And here are the two founders. Um, so we worked with Econcrete, and this is Shimri and Ido, the, the two founders, um, in our $100,000 Ray of Hope Prize competition. Um, so at the Biomimicry Institute, we run a number of different programs that help support nature-inspired innovation and, and biomimetic innovation. Um, we start at a really young age. So we have programs that actually bring this concept of nature-inspired design into classrooms. Uh, right now, we are uh, it's an optional activity that teachers and students can do as part of the Youth Design Challenge, but we're actually working within the California State School District to bring this in and, and meet next-gen science standards so that hopefully your middle schoolers and high schoolers in the US are not only going to learn about an organism in biology, but they could also learn from that organism and actually create a design based on what they're learning. So we think that we have to start reaching the, our future designers and engineers at an early age and start kind of bringing this, this thought process of, you know, nature, this is this warehouse of information. How can we make our world a better and safer place? 
So moving along our program timeline, the next program we have is our Biomimicry Global Design Challenge. And this is one that I, I think you all might be interested in. This is where we provide resources and materials that help college age students, university students, and young professionals bring biomimicry into the world. We help them walk through our design process and also provide some resources to help them along the way. And then we have our, our launch pad, which is an early stage incubator um, that's specifically for design challenge participants. And, and then the Ray of Hope Prize. So the Ray of Hope Prize, it's a $100,000 prize competition um, that we run in partnership with the Ray C. Anderson Foundation. And Ray Anderson was the founder of Interface Carpet Tile. Um, it's, a multi, it's a billion dollar company. And they're actually one of the first companies to make a carbon neutral or carbon negative pledge, which they made back in the 90s, actually, uh, in early 2000s. And as a textile manufacturer, it's really incredible that they've been able to, to meet a lot of their goals. And a big reason they did that was because of their practice of bringing biomimicry into their design table. So Interface, they had a, they had a, a mandate to go out into the forest and look at the forest floor because everyone loves seeing beautiful fall leaves on the forest floor. And what they learned was that in nature, these, the forest floor, it's, it's a random pattern. There's no, there's no kind of dictation about this leaf goes here, this leaf goes here, it's random. And they brought that randomness into their carpet design and, and it's been their top seller ever since. And then our last program, and this is kind of the, the backbone, our, our spine, so to speak, behind all the programs is Ask Nature. And if you go to asknature.org, we have a website where you kind of have this search bar. You can type in things like waterproof, as an example, and we'll show you how plants and animals keep themselves dry. Um, so this is great for designers, startups, engineers who might be have a design challenge that they're trying to figure out. Um, a great example was th there was a group we were working with from MIT who they had a, a soft bodied robot that was trying to navigate through uh, water pipes. Um, but you can't see things in a water pipe and you don't can't really have control of it. So what they found were that there's these fish called the blind cave fish. So fish that can't see that navigate based on pressure differentials. So they, knowing that, they actually integrated pressure differential sensors into the robot so that it could kind of control where it was going and work its way through the pipe. Um, another great thing about this is that we have a system of information and hierarchy that you can go through. So if you go in and, and look at uh, Ask Nature strategy pages, I, I want you to look on the left here. Um, let's say you're a farmer, or let's say you, you're starting a new agricultural company, maybe it's a vertical farm, and you want to protect your crops from physical harm. So you could click on that, that button there, protect from physical harm. Um, and let's say we, we're facing a problem with fungus, you could pick, we want to protect from living threats, and then we want to protect from fungi. And then all of a sudden, all of these different strategies and solutions pop up that already exist in the natural world. And we curate this information. This is, this is coming from academic research. What we do is we, we scour kind of the academic journals and work with our science communication team to translate that into language that's appropriate for a more general audience and appropriate for engineers and startups. Um, so I wanna share with you an example of a company that's doing this. So notice over here, we have chemicals and oregano act as a fungicide. Um, we have an, a video explaining that here. So let's see. All right, I'm gonna to try to play this. Right until you sink your teeth into them, fresh fruit and vegetables are at risk from fungal infection. And this is a big nuisance to fruit producers who lose around 25% of fruit to fungi spoilage each year. That's even after the use of synthetic fungicides, which are the go-to solution for this problem. But the use of these chemicals is problematic. They have negative effects on both the health of humans and the environment, adversely impact honeybee pollination, and are easily washed away from plants. And because many have a single mode of action, fungi can mutate and develop resistance to them over time. But many plants have evolved their own natural defenses. For example, plants like oregano produce compounds which have antifungal properties. These can be extracted easily and used as natural fungicides. However, their use is limited because they break down quickly within the environment. 
To overcome this, the company Nanomic has collected a range of these compounds and encapsulated them in tiny biological containers. This protects the compounds from being broken down and helps them to attach to plants. If the fruits are attacked by fungi, the pH of the plant's surface becomes more acidic and this causes the capsules to break open and release their contents, which quickly kills the fungi. The best bit is that Nanomix plant-powered products have been demonstrated to be more effective than synthetic fungicides. And because they're derived from plants, they're safe for humans and the environment, keeping your fruit fresh and tasty for longer. So I just, I love that I, I come from an agricultural and, and kind of food background with some of my past work. So I think a couple things stand out for me with this company. Um, they're based in, in Turkey, uh, they came out of Istanbul. And um, they actually, the, the two founders learned that their grandparents and their great grandparents used to dip uh, harvested produce into oregano oil uh, to preserve it. And as they kind of advanced through university and, and started to examine, um, they started to ask the question, well, why did that work? And what they discovered were these molecules. Um, and you know, their unique IP, their unique intellectual property is the encapsulation that goes around those molecules. And they're doing the, they're looking at this now with a lot of other um, plants as well. Um, we couldn't cover it in the video, but plants also have kind of like an immune system. It's not like our human immune system, but, but they're, plants can defend themselves from crops. Um, one of the cool things that oregano does and some of these other plant species do is they actually activate plants' immune systems. So it makes them hardier uh, against crops in the first place or against pests in the first place. So yeah, I love that company. So this is, I have a lot of other examples I want to share, but um, I know we just threw a lot of information at you and I want to get to some questions, but I wanted to end with this quote from Andreessen Horowitz. And this was in their BioEats World Manifesto that came out about, I think it was exactly a year ago. So um, it's that today, bio today is where information technology was 50 years ago on the precipice of touching all of our lives. I think when they wrote this manifesto, they were specifically talking about biotech, about CRISPR engineering, DNA, and about pharmaceuticals. And, and they're right. We're, we're, we have the ability to do things with, with biology that we've never been able to do before. I think what I wanna leave you with and challenge you all with is, we also have the tools and technology to understand how nature functions and works at, at really a basic level. A, a lot of what we're seeing in biomimicry are things that work at a nanoscale. Um, we have super slippery surfaces that actually have ridges and bumps because of what we're learning from nature. You know, smooth surfaces, again, don't really exist. So how can we learn to make more aerodynamic planes or, or ship hulls based on, on things that we observe in nature? Um, I think I also just want to mention that, you know, nature exists in ecosystems. It's, it's systemic. There's, there's systems that come into play. And um, that's an area that we're also exploring. And, and we see a, a great example of that in a lot of wastewater treatment facilities. You know, we have typically our, our sewage plants collect all the water, they process it. And more and more, we're, we're learning that wetlands also play an important role. So how might we be able to work with wetlands? How might we be able to work with a living ecosystem to treat our wastewater? Um, we have a lot to learn from nature. Um, and we believe that by doing that, and by learning, you know, truly learning from nature, by practicing biomimicry, we're going to create a, a healthier, more sustainable world. So I'm going to stop my screen here, and then Dustin, I would love to come back and yeah, talk a little bit. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, we can come back to the slide deck later if we want to kind of talk about some more of those examples. But um, really awesome uh, presentation and primer on on biomimicry, and yeah, just super interesting. I think the case studies really make it clear like what this is conceptually, because it can seem a little. Uh, a big topic, I guess, for people. Um, I want to ask you first about, you know, it's kind of a personal, uh, well, I'm not, I guess not a personal question, but what are some of the areas that you're most excited about today personally um, for innovation or, or things that you believe can be positively disrupted by uh, biomimicry? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think I'm 
being so as we talk about climate change and and climate solutions, a lot of what we're talking about is how do we sequester carbon? How do we get carbon neutral by buying carbon offsets, things like that? Um, I think I'm really interested in maybe the question is how do we redesign our world so we don't produce that amount of waste in the first place? Um, for example, um, most of the synthetic clothing you wear, like um, uh, you know, a lot of the wicking sports gear or whatnot, nylon, it's made from oil, like that's petroleum based. And you, no one kind of looks at oil and says, oh, that's going to make a, a good dress or that's going to make a beautiful shirt, right? Um, so how might we learn from how nature protects things? You know, uh, polar bears have extremely high quality kind of thermal insulation based on their hair. How might we learn from that to create... Um, uh, a coat or a jacket that, that can protect us from the cold? How might we learn from how species uh, produce color to make clothing that, that uh, doesn't have to be dyed and, and kind of the harmful dyeing process, which is one of the biggest causes of water pollution? Yeah, yeah, I love that answer because I feel like as people talk about moving towards a green economy, most of the attention is all on uh, fuels to heat homes and fuels to transport vehicles. But obviously, yeah, synthetic petroleum based products are in so many other things. And so just reimagining like how to look at yeah, clothing without um, some of those synthetic inputs. Yeah, really, really interesting. Love that. Um, yeah. Next question I have here uh, from the audience, uh, somebody asked uh, about, you know, joining the biomimicry network, you know, if somebody uh, is a, a professional and they want to join a, a mentor network, is there um, a place to kind of reach out to, to work with biomimicry? Oh, cool. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, a couple different options. So if you want to participate in any of the design challenges, those are open. We also are always looking for mentors and coaches, um, especially for that youth design challenge uh, for the K through 12. Um, we're, we're always looking for people who want to volunteer and work with some younger um, learners there. Um, I think there's also some really great opportunities to learn more about biomimicry. So there's a course that we run um, in partnership with Biomimicry South Africa called Learn Biomimicry. So if you just go to learnbiomimicry.com, uh, you can kind of take a deep dive into a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, and then I think last but not least, you know, as we're working with these startups, uh, especially some of these startups that are already selling product and already have received investment, um, we're always looking for other investors, especially impact investors and, and corporates who might be interested in meeting these teams because our goal is to um, is to to get these solutions out there into the world. So awesome, perfect. Yeah, that question actually came from Bandana, who I know uh, she has worked with um, some of the Thought for Food teams for the, oh, the okay. past uh, challenge. So uh, I think she's coming from some yeah experience with mentoring startups. Uh, well, I have a question about you know, uh, and I feel like I kind of know the answer, but is biomimicry really just for hardware products, or is there any applicability to any software engineers who are uh, on the call? It that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, I certainly think that most of the biomimicry solutions we see are hardware based. A lot of them are deep tech, you know, academic spin outs. Um, but there certainly are software applications. Um, one company that, that's in Australia, um, Red Grid, they are making a smart energy grid based off of kind of principles that you see uh, hive based insects follow. So, like, honeybees and, and ants, you know, individually, like an individual ant is really dumb and can't make decisions for itself. But when you have <laughs> five, you know, all of a sudden it becomes this kind of super organism. And what we're realizing are that each ant or each honeybee might have three specific kind of questions. That's not the right word, but three specific things they're looking for. And based on those three decision points, they come back and share that with the rest of the hive. And based then on all of these different decision points coming together, so now all of a sudden you have all of these data points, you can, uh, the hive can collectively make a joint decision. Um, so I think we see a lot of that kind of in swarm intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, I would also just mention that I, I think we also see some really interesting applications on I guess, I guess this is hardware again. I was going to say hardware 
for um, that's allowing for for some software solutions. Like mm -hmm. um, if we want to have uh, driverless cars, we need LIDAR and radar sensors. So how do we pr produce those in a way that maybe can mimic like an owl's eyeball that can see things uh, really sharply at night? Mm -hmm. Or how do we make sure we keep that surface clean? So I think I think oftentimes biomimicry is an enabling technology and it can also be a, a, a platform technology as well. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, I want to kind of ask, you know, for, for non-biologists or non-scientists, you know, for those who are just new to biomimicry, you mentioned asknature.org, which has, yeah, I, I've been on there and I know there's tons of like ideas and resources. You know, what are some other best practices out there for non-specialists to research potential biomimicry um, solutions to, um, to product design challenges? It's a great question. You definitely don't have to be a scientist. Um, I think you know, one, one thing we are seeing is that a lot of our teams eventually uh, have a PhD on, on their team, but it oftentimes doesn't have to start that way. Um, so I want to actually share an example, and this kind of gets back to the fashion one too. So I'm going to share my screen again here, Dustin. Perfect. Um, so give me a second to pull this one up. Um, great. So we just talked about textiles and people don't realize the enormous climate impact our clothes has on the planet. Um, it's the cause of 20% of our wastewater worldwide. This is a real picture of, in, of kind of effluent coming out of a, a textile plant, I think in um, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So this team of fashion designers and textile designers, they weren't scientists, they're students studying textile design and, and textiles in school they asked this really amazing question of you know how does nature get their how does nature get this brilliant color and they were specifically intrigued by the discosoma coral shown here um, they kind of went beyond they didn't just say i want to replicate that color i want to make that same color they were really asking this fundamental question of how does the coral produce that color and for this discosomer coral, it's actually produced as a protein. Um, it's called red fluorescent protein, and it's used as a, a biomarker already in science. But so, so it's very well studied. But these textile designers, again, not scientists, realized that it was this protein. And knowing it was this protein, and knowing that there were advances in biotechnology, they were able to synthesize, uh, grow, essentially E. coli bacteria that, that produce this protein and synthesize them into textile fibers. Um, so here's a great example of these, this team came up with the idea, learned some of the science to make her proof of concept, and then joined up with a, a leading scientist who, who really understands kind of this textile market. And, and that's how they got their start. Um, I'll just mention, I think a lot of our design challenge participants are also not scientists. A lot of them are engineers and industrial designers. And what we see oftentimes there are things, they're, they're looking at more structural things. So think about a basking shark or a manta ray. They have their, their filter feeder. They just swim through the water with their mouth open all the time. So how do they capture their particles? Um, they actually have these, what they're called gill rakers that kind of cause little vortexes in the water that shoot the particles of food into their stomach. So that right there, if you can under, if, if you can first find out about that, that, which is part of the goal of Ask Nature, and then understand kind of from an engineering perspective how that works, you can create an engineering design that might mimic that same sort of filtration technique. Perfect, perfect. I love this example. It relates to one of the audience questions that uh, I guess I want to ask next, um, because you, you mentioned that these, you know, these were uh, basically fashion students. Um, and Ellie asks, uh, and feel free to rehash any of the kind of programs you've already kind of mentioned. But so Ellie asks, um, you know, what can college students do to get more in touch with biomimicry? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the starting place is um, check out the, the biomimicry global design challenge. Um, and we have a lot of resources there. We have what we call the biomimicry toolbox and um, just a bunch of other resources that will help you go through this design process. And it incorporates a lot of things you might find in, in a human-centered design process as well. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can see me again. Um, so I think that's a starting place. I think the other thing I'd recommend is, you know, 
as a college student, take a biology class. Like I, I studied mechanical engineering and I had an intro to biology. Um, but I, I, would, I would encourage you to, like I think part of what makes biomimicry so interesting and fascinating is that it's really multidisciplinary. Like for so long we've separated like the, the, our human built world is different than our natural world. And I think biologists and, and naturalists thought the same thing. Our natural world is different than our human built world. But what we're finding is it's a continuum. As we build, as humans build things that affects the natural world, as the natural world, you know, kind of goes through all of its processes of hurricanes and everything like that affects our built world. So I, I, I also see this being multidisciplinary. So I think I'd recommend checking out the design challenge, check out Ask Nature, and then um, explore explore some of these areas a little bit more perfect yeah i kind of love the way you mentioned you know siloing and sometimes you hear in academia the uh, ivory tower or whatever where you know different i guess areas of expertise are siloed from one another i mean do you think that there is an innovation to commercialization gap or or a clog in terms of like basic research making its way into products that are actually on the market? And um, if so, any any thoughts about, you know, fixing that or minimizing that gap in any way? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I'm going to share my screen again and share another example here. Um, so here we go. This is a mantis shrimp. I'm sharing this in response to your question, Dustin, because scientists have been studying the mantis shrimp for years. Um, and for this particular case study, I think scientists were looking at the mantis shrimp's club for 10 years. And what they were looking at, what these researchers were looking at was the shrimp can punch at a speed faster than a 22 caliber, bu caliber bullet. So like it punches extremely fast and it punches shells. Like it punches really hard things to break them open. Yet its club never breaks. So like you would think based on laws of physics, its club would break eventually. So these scientists were fascinated by this. What they discovered was that this club has this helical kind of architecture. So it's made out of chitin, which is the same thing that um, the rest of its body is made out of, but it's layered in a way that's kind of offset by about 15 degrees, which actually it dissipates energy, right? So again, it took scientists like 10 years to, to dig in and, and really start to understand this. Um, and it took until um, the founder of Helicoid Industries saw this technology sitting in the technology transfer office and with his background in composite materials said, oh my goodness, we can bring this into carbon fiber. We can bring this into the composite market. So now that they license this technology from the university and they're testing um, this on planes, can they make lighter weight planes that are stronger and, and more durable? Um, which will obviously save fuel cost. They, their um, models have shown and they're just starting to do the testing that they could potentially double the length of a wind turbine blade by including this. And if, if for those that know energy, doubling the length of a wind turbine blade that would quadruple the en energy output. Um, but yeah, I think this is an example, Dustin, of like, we're so like, I'm, I'm so thankful that the founder came along and found this technology in the, in the tech transfer office Otherwise, we wouldn't have this advancement. And, and I think part of that where I'm looking is where are some of the labs that we know are um, starting to spin out more companies? Um, so we're trying to plug in there. But, but I would also encourage all of you, if you're university affiliated, like have a talk with your tech transfer office. Oftentimes in biology and chemistry, they're mainly targeting pharmaceutical companies and they're not thinking about um, about some of the other applications. So I think I think there's a lot lot there. Absolutely. I, I, really, I love that advice for individuals to like, you know, whatever your local research university is kind of reach out to the tech transfer office if, if there is one. And I know at Foundry Institute, you know, as kind of players in the startup ecosystem, we are looking to partner with different tech transfer offices for exactly the same reason, because we know that there's like innovation that's kind of there that's sort of looking for a route to commercialization. And so I think if you're an early stage entrepreneur or just looking for your next thing, like, yeah, that's um, really great advice. I, I love that. 
Um, I want to ask an audience question from Nikita. Um, it seems kind of, uh, yeah, really, it's, it's a straight question. So, um, you know, uh, how do you go about sharing uh, and designing an idea with, uh, without patent issues? Have you heard mm -hmm. of companies that are struggling with patent or, or IP in the process of designing uh, a new idea? And if so, kind of any advice for uh, IP? <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. I'm so I'm not a, an IP lawyer, so I just want, need to preface that up front. Um, so so once it, so I also preface that one, as soon as you get into DNA and kind of altering DNA, that is a whole other kind of intellectual property conversation to have. So I'll I'll go back to that example of helicoid industries. So they can't patent the mantis shrimp. Like you can't have a patent on an animal or what exists in that animal or kind of a a function that that animal, you know, produces or does, but you can patent the application to our built environment. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think that there's the difference. And that's where, why we see a lot of biomimicry solutions they are coming originally from academic research papers. And then people learn from that and are able to create a, a you know, start getting intellectual property. Mm -hmm based on the human kind of built environment design. So in Helicoid's use case, they have the patent on the, uh, the composite uh, pro uh, manufacturing process of, of the layering of the, of the composites. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it is a, I think it's a discussion point. I mean, as an organization, it's something we talk about a lot. If we're learning from nature and we're learning from organisms and ecosystems, do we have an ethical, like, should there be an ethical responsibility to financially supporting those ecosystems and financially supporting, um, you know, those aspects of what we're learning from? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, it's a conversation that I think is, is worthwhile to have. Um, and there's a lot to explore there. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and maybe if the application, unlike this case, like if, if you're taking something, I guess, from basic research and you're working again with like a technology transfer office, they might be licensing the intellectual property to you. Yep. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's a, yeah, that's definitely, it's a whole rabbit hole in and of itself, uh, intellectual property, but um, you know, there, there are definitely protections to go about. Um, yeah. Any, any kind of case that you're going after. Um, yeah. There, there's well, a couple and just real quick to that point. Um, I would also say because most of what, a lot of what I'm presenting, again, they're platform technologies. It's not gonna be used by just one industry. It can be used across a range of industries. We oftentimes see kind of exclusive licensing deals. So there's an, an example, um, I, I don't have a slide for this one, but um, it, adhesives, so like glue adhesives are really toxic usually. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they also don't really work well in wet, moist environments. Um, when we look to see like how mussels, for example, cling to rocks underwater, there's some really interesting mechanisms that happen there. And um, one of the kind of, uh, uh, one of the innovations we're seeing in this space was actually funded by the dental industry. Um, so that the dental um, company that funded this research into uh, mollusks and how they attach to water, they own the intellectual property for dental applications. But the company and the researchers who are now spinning out a new startup uh, have a license for every industry other than dental. So um, I just wanted to mention that, uh, yeah, once you get into tech transfer, there's a lot of interesting use cases. I'm not an expert by any means there, but uh, I, yeah, it's worthwhile to explore if it's something you're interested in. Perfect. We have a couple of audience questions that are like very specific. So, you know, to, you can feel free to take it or leave it. If you can't you know, speak to it, that's fine. Um, Tio asks, has anybody cultivated a microalgae to convert waste into biofuel to, to clean ocean waste? Are you, are you aware of any uh, examples related to that? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, so when, when we approach kind of specific human design problems, one of the things we want to ask is, um, what we like to say, like, how do you biologize that problem? <laughs> so to biologize that, if we were to go through the ask nature kind of um, framework, you might ask, how might we, how might we transport material? Because mm -hmm. we're trying to get rid of waste. And then you can kind of go down and, and you can start to filter through. Um, and I, I have seen some applications, especially around kind of capturing, oh, 
rainwater runoff from agricultural fields that incorporate algae into their systems to, to treat that kind of at the point source. Um, I don't know of any that's working kind of actually in the ocean on an ocean level. And I think, again, my question would be is how, biologizing that question is how, how might we, um, how might we transport material? How might we get rid of that material or how might we convert that into something benign? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and look to see the pathways that exist in nature that that, that happens. Uh, Deepak has been engaging in the chat a lot. He has uh, he has given a one line pitch, so um, I'll, I'll kind of just yeah. read it, and you can uh, you know make it make of it what you will. So there's no editing here or not much. Uh, he says we're designing an AI led IoT cryptocurrency which incentivizes biomimicry or using organic computation for ecological complexity slash biodefense scoring. That's kind of a mouthful. I'm honestly not sure, but he asked you, know, can you offer feedback on his one line pitch concept or you know, how, he, how he could build upon it and move forward with it um, with the Biomimicry Institute? Cool, well, yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing. And I would certainly be intrigued to learn a little more. Um, I'll put on like my, my startup coaching hat here. So stepping a little bit away from biomimicry and more in this role of supporting startups, I think, um, I think one thing that I might just advise from the from the one sentence pitch is to watch out for buzzwords um, and figure out how you can communicate without using jargon. Mm -hmm. So I'm not I don't know anything really about AI or quantum. I'm also not a, a crypto um, person. So I, I, I can't quite understand what you're working on. So I think my startup coaching advice there would be for, for all of you is how can you communicate what you're doing in terms that maybe like a high school or elementary school student would understand? Yeah. Um, I think that's great feedback. Yeah, I, we saw, I syndicated an article like a couple of months ago that was about your, if you can pitch it to your grandma mm -hmm. and grandma can understand it, then it then it's really getting there. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. There's a book I recommend and we have all of our um, startups read called The Mom Test. Horrible name. It could be called something else, but the premise is kind of what Dustin said is if you approach your mom or approach your grandma with an idea, they're probably going to pat you on the back and say, oh, that's great. And then the conversation kind of dies. And you might look at that through the lens of they validated my idea. This must be good. Mm -hmm. But you didn't get any useful information there. So what you're going to want to do is how do you ask questions and learn from past behavior? And that, that's a big part of what I focus on with our startups, um, especially since we're bringing in something new that hasn't been seen in the world before. Um, how can you get past history information like oh when was the last time you that problem happened to you what did you do when you faced that problem instead of pitching oh i have a new gps solution it's like well when was the last time that you got lost while you were on a hike great tell me about how you got out of that situation um it's, it's a little subtle mindset shift but i think it's important to remember as a young startup the only the only answer for a future facing question is will you buy my solution? And the only answer you can get is if they actually buy it, if there's a transaction or if they use it, if, if, it's a, if you have users, not customers. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, uh, this one's kind of more of a personal question. So, and you've already shared a lot of really cool examples, but you know, of all the different impact companies you've worked with, with Biomimicry Institute or TFF or your you know, roles at Penn State, um, what innovations have inspired you the most um, that you've kind of you know, worked with the founders? That's a great question. Um, man, I get so inspired by so many of these. I think technology-wise, um, Cypress Materials, the, the self-assembling paint is just one of the most amazing technologies I've come across. And I think it has, it's game-changing. And I think one of the signs of why it's game-changing is they're, they're making sales already. Um, and they just incorporated not too long ago. Like it, it's a company that, that probably for growth at some point they're going to need to raise funding but they're already revenue generating um i have another example of a company that i th think is fascinating um and this one i i love because I, I just think i think the founders are really great i think they complement each other well so let me share my screen um 
And this one actually came out of Penn State University, coincidentally. Uh -huh. um, well, we have another question about Penn State that I'll ask you next yeah. then, so yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, so um, this came out of the Nature Inspired Engineering Lab at Penn State, and this is a pitcher plant. It's a carnivorous pitcher plant. When this pitcher plant is dry, ants can walk around that red ring. When it gets wet, they slip, they fall right in. So reachers wanted to know what caused that slippery mechanism, and what they found was that when it gets wet, it, it kind of gets the ring gets infused with that liquid to cause this super slippery kind of surface area. So there's bumps and ridges that capture that liquid that just cause it to be almost, I mean, like slipping on a sheet of ice or something. Mm. So this company, Spotless Materials, you can see an uncoated nice. piece of ceramic on the left and a piece of coated ceramic on the right. And this is oatmeal that is supposed to represent poop, human waste. Um, so if you coat your toilet with this, this is, how much more efficient and slippery this, uh, you know, yeah, this is just what will happen in the toilet. And this is interesting there, you know, they, they started this actually as part of the Gates reinvent the toilet project. Um, but there's applications across so many industries. So think about, uh, you know, the big cargo ships, the ship hulls, they're in the ocean for weeks at a time and they get barnacles and things that grow on them. If you can have a super slippery surface where things can't attach, you're going to save an immense amount on fuel costs. Or same thing with, um, I mean, uh, maybe something that's more close to home is like windshields. Like, uh, how might this help repel rainwater from from car windshields or plane windshields? And how does this allow us to transition to kind of the electric vehicle self-driving car economy? So, yeah, I think there's been a ton. I also love some of the lower tech solutions. So there was a group I worked with as part of Thought for Food based out of um, Uganda. And there in, in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, like up to 50% of the crops go to waste every year because there's no post-harvest solution. Like mangoes, these delicious mangoes will just rot because there's no way to preserve them. So they created this um, really simple, easy to use uh, dehydrator that uses uh, like corn husks or coconut husks as heat to dry out um, the, the crops. So I think I get inspired by the, the deep tech and the teams and then also some, some lower tech solutions. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, so this just because it's also Penn State related and this came out of a Penn State research lab, Connie asks you, she says, uh, my, my, my chem PhD is from PSU. As a Mechie student, did you ever come across uh, any of the ag professors or she says, Professor Andrew Reed with the, the Huck Institute? So kind of a who you know at Penn State who's been interesting. I never actually even heard of the, the, um, the lab group that you said that came out of um, that was it is like very biomimicry aligned. Um, yeah, Dustin and I both went to Penn State together. It's where we met. Um, yeah, there's actually Penn State has a quite a number of kind of biomimetic research coming out. Um, there was actually a really interesting article about lightning bugs, an academic article where Penn State researchers were studying why lightning bugs lights were so bright, like based on calculations, they shouldn't be that bright. Uh, this is where kind of some of the biology goes over my head. But what they found was that they have kind of like slits in their abdomen that are asymmetrical, hmm. which causes different wavelengths of light to go out, which actually increases the intensity. So they're starting to apply that kind of slit design into LED lights to make them more efficient and, and make them more intense. So yeah, I think this happens across a range of um, disciplines, across a range of colleges. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where are you, you've kind of spoken to this a little bit before, like the different kinds of teams, but where are you finding, you know, successful teams coming from? How do the teams get formed? Any thoughts or best practices uh, around that? Yeah, I think, um, so putting on kind of that investor, like startup scout hat, um, we work with quite a number of what I might say, like deep tech accelerators to source some of our teams. So one of my, um, Favorites, it's a great program, is called Activate. Um, and they work specifically with scientist founders. So they will give actually a, like a postdoc or a PhD researcher a two year fellowship. So they pay for two years of their time to develop their research into a commercialized solution. Um, so that's called Activate. Right now they have a hub in um, Berkeley and a hub at MIT. I think 
The other areas though, I'm, I'm glad there was some uh, ask about agriculture. I think we see a lot of solutions in the agriculture sector. Um, I wanna share one more example about ag here just to, to show. So this, um, one second. So what you see on the screen here, this big picture is a nematode. Nematodes are the most abundant living organism on the planet. Um, there's more nematodes in like a cubic foot of soil than I think there are humans or something like that. It's incredible. Um, and nematodes can either be parasitic or they can be beneficial. When they're parasitic, they attack plants, roots, crop roots. When they're beneficial, they'll attack pest organisms like moths or, or caterpillars. Um, these nematodes communicate via chemical pheromones. So they release chemical signals saying, hey, I found food over here, or hey, the food source is depleted over here, which will then disperse or attract nematodes. So the company Pheronim, um, the, the founders have been studying nematodes for 10 plus years in an agricultural setting realized they had this chemical communication system and have now commercialized a synthetic uh, pheromone, they call it pheronym, um, that can either attract or repel nematodes. Um, so to answer your question, I think, well, biomimicry happens across industry. I think we see it kind of popping up in, in specific categories like uh, food and agriculture, we see that quite a bit. We see it quite a bit in the sanitation space. Nature's really great at disposing of waste. Mm -hmm. And then I think we see it on the material science kind of nano nanotech side of things. So, Perfect, perfect. Well, we're reaching the end here. Uh, so only kind of a few more questions to go. Uh, I guess I want to I want to get to this audience question, so feel free to kind of get to it quick. So JNM asks, um, have you uh, can you share any firms you know, or if you know any, that are working on biomimicry related to architecture? Yeah, there's actually quite a number. So there's a famous case study um, that is just slipping uh, the, the Westgate Building in in Kenya, I believe, or in Tanzania. Um, they were looking to create a more energy efficient building. And they were looking at termite mounds and how termite mounds remain a constant 74 degrees all the time. And it's because of airflow. Um, so, so that's a great example of a skyscraper that, that is based on biomimetic principles. And there's also a number of architecture studios that, that specifically are looking at biomimicry and even more that are looking at biophilia and, and some other kind of nature inspired design. Very cool. So yeah, the solutions are out there. Uh, you know, a couple examples there, but definitely like it's possible to dive into to that that overlap between architecture and biomimicry. Really cool. Um, I want to ask you, I guess, really quickly, is uh, just final closing tips for for entrepreneurs. You know, um, feel free to rehash any of the programs that you've talked about before. But for you know, early stage or aspiring founders who are maybe new to biomimicry, um, just you know, any any kind of final thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we have a lot to learn from the natural world. We, and if you think about it, like humans have been learning from nature since the dawn of civilization, really. Like that's how we've made all of our advances in food and, and medicine and um, agriculture. And even just until recently, like Da Vinci, uh, one of the greatest inventors of all time, you know, he studied flying, creature, he, he studied the human body and created inventions like the helicopter way before we, we could actually build the helicopter. It kind of seems like recently in the past 100, 200 years, we've stopped looking to nature and we've kind of trusted that humans are better at designing things and building things. And, um, you know, it's allowed for incredible advances. It's also now put us in this, this problem we have with the climate and, and with kind of environmental damages. So I think, I think we're at a really unique time to be exploring any sort of biological solution, whether it's biomimicry or biotech or anything. Like, I, I just think that, you know, where maybe uh, computer science programming was in the eighties and, and nineties, I think we're at that point with biology now. Like if you can teach yourself CRISPR, go, go get a, go get a kit in the mail. You can, you can do this at home and learn how to, how to bring kind of biology and engineer biology. Like 
Yeah, I, for me, I think that's what gets me excited and, and where I would recommend prospective entrepreneurs to look is, is how can we learn from and work with biology? Perfect. Yeah, that's well, this has been so interesting. Uh, so many great examples, uh, just a lot of really awesome insights that um, we we're going to take away from this. So I just want to say thank you, Jared, uh, for your time. Thank you to Biomimicry Institute for, for joining us, making you available and joining us. And thanks to everybody else who's um who's on the line here for, for joining today. Um, you know, you, everybody will receive a, a copy of this webinar in their email in about 48 hours. Um, so uh, you can definitely, you know, reshare it out to people if, uh, if anybody came to mind. Um, so at any rate, Jared, thank you so much again for, for joining us um, today. Yeah, thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.